Our Bible reading tonight comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, spoiler alert, to 18. We're not going to go into verse, uh, chapter 5 yet. Hopefully that's next week. <laughs> Let's read God's word. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of the Lord. And the dead, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and ha- are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is God's word. Hello. Last time I got people to move around and move down the front, which I'm told hadn't been done before. We're not going to make you do that this time. This time my trick is that I've brought a friend. Hope that's okay. This is Joseph, and Joseph's going to share some uh, reflections and echoes um, as we move through the passage tonight. Uh, Joseph and I have the privilege of serving together at Macquarie Baptist, uh, where he's um, an unofficial ministry trainee with us. Can we can we call you that, Jojo? Or and a local? How local? Um, I live just around the corner. Um, y- yes. yes. And Cherry Brook High. And all that. Great. First thing I want you to do is just look around and see if there is someone you can talk to and say hi, uh, because in the moment I will have a discussion question for you to share with that person. Bonus points if you do the thing where you actually connect with someone you don't know. Try that. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, sure. Maybe, yeah. Okay, well done. Uh, Tonight we're thinking about a challenging topic. I found out uh, just on Friday night that our church treasurer, uh, her name is Sherry, and her grandfather in China uh, has just died from covid We've experienced a number of COVID-connected deaths, not directly in our congregation, but relatives and friends around the world. We've also had uh, one of our dear church members, Phyllis, dear old Phyllis, the lady in pink, they would call her, uh, elderly, died in her time, but at a great loss and sadness to our church. We said goodbye to our dear friend. For me, she will always be an example of what I want to be when I'm in my 90s serving and following Jesus. Tonight, we are thinking about death. For us as Christians, death represents a considerable challenge to our faith. So much of what we believe and what we've been promised 
will not be resolved this side of death. We must wait. And we must hold on all the way up to that moment before we will ever see what so much has been promised to us in the gospel. That's a challenge. And it's made all the more challenging when people die still waiting for that hope. A hope unseen is a hope indeed, right? God does not want you to be unsure or uncertain at all about what is going to happen to you on the other side of death. Death is like a curtain that we are all walking toward, one inevitable step after another. We like to calculate. We like to reassure ourselves that that's still a long way off. I've got so many decades left. But you know and I know that's not how death works. It is a curtain through which we cannot see by our own eyes. And yet we walk closer and closer to it. And as far as you and I know, that curtain is here. Only by God's grace each day does my heart beat again. My lungs fill with air. I can't even make it happen. And yet each day I wake, that curtain has not yet fallen. If you've not spent some time thinking about your mortality, then you've not really thought through the incredible power of the promise of Jesus. So that's where we're going to sit t tonight, just for a moment together. And I know that's a heavy topic. It's the deep end of the pool. But it helps us so much if it's something we've thought through together. So have a look again at your Bible. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us tonight. The Apostle says, brothers, sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed. We don't want you to be uninformed, that's clueless, about those who sleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope, right? Verse 14, for we believe, here it is, here's the rock solid foundation, we believe Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe again that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So let's pause for a minute. It is not okay, as a Christian, to think wrongly about what happens after death. That's what the scriptures are telling us here. Four popular false ideas, contrary to the gospel. The first is the idea that death, well, it, it is the end. The lights go out and that's it. Oh, and if there's living on after death, well, you live on in the memories of your loved ones. We're right in movie land here, aren't we, with that belief. Or a second false belief about death. That somehow at death, I will melt into the oneness of the universe. My children will be able to look up into the stars and Pick a twinkling star and say, that's dad, you know. 
I can sense his presence. That Eastern idea is again wrong. A third false idea is that after death, I step into some incredibly drawn out intermediate state. Maybe a spirit cast adrift from a body, seeking resolution, seeking peace. How many great movies have been on that premise, right? Were you there for Flatliners in the 1990s? What a movie. Or that Catholic teaching that after you die, your soul must spend some time being literally purged by fire in purgatory, hence the name. So that your relatives are left praying, oh, please let daddy not spend any much longer in purgatory. Please let his soul be set free from those fires. That is not a Christian hope. And fourthly, the fourth error is to have not thought about it at all. Just to carry along some vague idea that death is, well, death's not my thing at the moment. That's just way off in the future. I'm busy living this life now. That is not a Christian perspective at all. So tonight, can you see with me in verse 14? We believe. And again in verse 14, we believe. Do you see it? We believe in the resurrection of Jesus. That on the third day, he pushed through that curtain of death, through the other side, and back again. And made open a way. Verse 14, so we do not grieve like the rest of mankind. Verse 13 and verse 14, now we believe, you see it, that God is going to do something for us now through Jesus, to bring us with Jesus. This is your faith, Christian. This is your belief about what happens after death. It's integral to the gospel. If you know Jesus, you know exactly what is happening on the other side of that curtain. In fact, you can see through the curtain with certainty. So that's the first thing. Resurrection is a certainty if you know Jesus. And secondly, for the Christian... My death, your death, will be like sleep. In what way? Sleep is where this weird thing happens, metaphysically. Where timelines separate for the sleeping and the waking. I had sinus surgery three or four years ago. I'm lying in the hospital bed counting backwards for the anaesthetist. It's something they do for fun. Next thing I know, I'm thinking, hurry up and do the surgery. This is getting weird. And the nurse comes over and says, it's all done. Weird, because an hour of my life did not happen, it seemed. But I'm telling you, for that team in the room, and there seemed to be a lot of them, they spent an hour with my lifeless body. <laughs> For them, it looked like I was sleeping. For me, that time did not happen. That's why it's the best word to describe what you will experience and what we will experience as observers. Our dear friend Phyllis, the lady in pink, from our point of view, her body lies sleeping in the ground or her ashes in the earth. But for Phyllis, the hundreds of years, the thousands of years, the however long it takes will not happen. You will pass. 
in the moment of your death into the presence of Jesus. While the rest of world history will see you as someone who slept for thousands and thousands of years until the end. Do you get it? The timelines, the experience diverges. There will be no drifting of your soul. There will be no loosed off ghost. There is no purgatory. Believe it tonight that this is what Jesus won for you on the cross. This is why he gave his life for you. So that you can know for certainty the moment of your death. You walk through that curtain into his arms. There may be pain on the way there. Life may be a life of suffering in these bodies. And these bodies will decay and death will have its way in certain ways as it draws near. I'm turning 50 next year. I know all about it, I can tell you. But be absolutely sure of this. Your Savior has got you. Your Lord is master on the other side. Your friend is ready for you. Isn't that a beautiful part of the gospel? You will pass into eternity in the arms of Jesus. I'm going to ask Joseph to share some of his reflections now. Um, I'd like you to notice the first sentence, which is in verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant. As Tim said, God does not want you to be unsure or uncomfortable thinking about death. If you are someone who identifies as a Christian and haven't thought through about death, whether it is your own or your loved ones, I urge you as a brother to take this opportunity tonight to really embrace tonight's passage and wrestle with it and pray about it. It is not okay as a Christian to be uncertain about what comes after death. I would like to also point out that Paul does not say, do not grieve. In verse 14, um, it is not the Christian message to say, do not grieve or do not mourn. Mm. Uh, we are not told, don't be sad or don't be down. No. Instead, if we take a closer look at the sentence, it reads, do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. According to Paul, what sets apart Christians and non-believers in times of grief? Not that Christians are to be ecstatic or excited, it's not even that Christians should be apathetic. No. Death is real, and it affects everyone in a deeply impactful way. So what sets apart Christians? Hope. When the world sees death as the end of the line, the void, they call it, everything turns black, and uh, we are to have hope for what comes next. So let's be encouraged in knowing that our God doesn't want us to denounce our emotions, but wants us to strengthen our relationship with him through hope. Can I just say, if you are someone that has experienced death of someone close in your life, or if you are someone that has the thought of death close to your heart, let me encourage you, God knows your heart. Please don't be afraid to let him know how hurt you are or how anxious and scared you are. If this is you, I urge you to please approach a brother or a sister for encouragement. Sure. Okay, so we know the certainty of resurrection for you, for me. 
And we know the death of a believer is like sleep. And thirdly, I want you to see in this text tonight that the death of a Christian is not a failure of the promise of the gospel in any way. Look with me at verse 15. Can you see it there? Verse 15. According to the Lord's word, says the apostle, we tell you, we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now look, as you're reading this, don't be ashamed of any of the descriptions here. There's a temptation in our sophisticated, what century are we up to now, minds, uh, with all that we know and all we understand and all these special effects we have seen in the movies, to read this as some kind of bad first century special effects reel. Rising up into the air, here come the clouds, there's the trumpet. The terminology here, every bit of it, is loaded language. It's language loaded with the unbreakability of the promise that is being made to you. That's what it is. The apostle is not so much describing the physics of what happens, but the metaphysics, right? The absolute, certain, underlying reality. First note in verse 16, it's the Lord himself that comes, returns. Absolutely, Jesus himself. Just as God once became flesh, came himself into our world. Child in a manger, born in weakness and vulnerability. So the Lord Jesus, now raised up from the dead and in all power and authority, this time returns in the flesh, but not vulnerable, not weak, almighty. And notice he comes down from heaven. That means just as now Jesus resides and reigns in the realm of absolute command. That's what we mean by heaven in this sense. It's from that place that his power descends. It's so sure it's grounded in the heavens, not in this fading, passing, crumbling earth. In the very throne of God. And at that time, reality of Jesus' reign will suddenly be very clear to everybody. Do you get that idea? And second, can you hear the audio track? There's a loud command. There's an archangel shouting. There's a trumpet call of the heavens. It's all in verse 16. It's loud because it's God's commanding voice saying, this is it. Let it be so. And there is no arguing with that voice. It's the voice that brought light out of darkness, that turned uncreation into everything we see. That voice. A voice that could call into the tomb of a four-day dead Lazarus and say, come out of there. A voice with which Jesus reached out and touched that little girl's hand and pulled her up from death. Talitha kum. That voice will call for you, friend, out of the chaos of a broken world. Lost in darkness, the same creator God will call your name from the dust and the ashes, and you will rise. You will rise. 
And third, notice that Jesus gathers us with him in the clouds and in the air. Do you see that in verse 17? These are profound biblical signposts that describe the absolute certainty and certain nature of the transformation that is going to happen to you and me. You see, the air, that's Bible terminology. It's first century terminology for the realm of the spirit beings. The earth where we inhabit, the heavens where God is Lord and King, and the, the, the realm of the air. You'll see it referred to in a place like Ephesians chapter 2, a place where even the devil seems to be king for a while. It's in that realm of the air where there is a, a contest, if you like. Competing spirit powers may have their sway for a time, but on this day, no more. Jesus is revealed as Lord of Lords, King of Kings over every power. He is the highest power, defeater of all evil. Places like Psalm 104 speak of the clouds as representative symbols of God's command. It says in Psalm 104 that he rides on the clouds in his majesty. It's the absolute command of Jesus that he now rides the clouds. Do you see the symbolism? Daniel chapter 7 foresaw that one like a son of man would approach the ancient of days, the great throne of God, coming in the clouds. Do you get it? Riding in absolute authority, the chariot of the heavens, if you like. And Jesus at the Transfiguration Mountain, right in the middle of each of the gospel stories, stands on a mountain enveloped in cloud and transfigures before them, and they see his true identity in the clouds. And at the end of the gospel narrative, as Jesus is taken away from his disciples and he disappears where? within the clouds. These are powerful descriptions of the basis and grounding of what is going to happen to you. When you are resurrected on that last day, it won't be like a hospital bed resuscitation. What's that machine they get? Clear. What do they call it? Medicos? Defibrillator? Yeah. Yeah. Weird word for an amazing machine, right? Let's get that heart going again. <gasps> the patient's up and running again. For a while, it's called a resuscitation, friends. To die again. That's what it means to be raised from the ground. But you will be raised from the authority of the heavens. By the command of God. And the almighty power of Jesus. And your identity will be grounded in the heavens, not in this perishing earth. You will be raised to never die again. See what the apostle says. You will be with him forever. At the end of verse 17. Forever. Forever. So I don't know physically what it's going to look like on that day. I don't know how Jesus will be seen by every eye at the same time around a spherical earth. I don't know if there'll be a physical lifting off the ground, us raising up into the sky. That gives me the heebie-jeebies as I think about that. Maybe you're scared of heights. But again, I don't think the apostle is trying to give us the physics, but the metaphysics. The essential certainty, the grounding, the essence. And on that day, the mighty voice of God will call you to his side. And you will rise up, never to fall again. Unbreakable, unrottable, of the heavens, you will be just like Jesus. You see how for us death is not merely a curtain that we must pass through? It's all that now stands. 
between us and the wonderful resolution of what is absolutely certain. It's as certain as Jesus, dead and raised. It's as certain as creation, that commanding voice of God. What a profound encouragement that should be for us. How much the promise of eternal life should be part of our daily encouragement of each other. And do you see, that's where the apostle lands in verse 18. He says, come on, encourage each other with this. This is so encouraging. Make this part of how you keep each other going as a Christian, working in your workplace, living in that home you're part of, working out your way in the world. With all the trials and the challenges and the temporary excitements, Let this be our encouragement, yes? Thanks, Joe. Sir, to finish, I'd like to offer a final encouragement to you tonight. I am someone who has struggled to think about the concept of Christian joy. Um, Although I am fortunate enough that no one close to me has died, I have experienced a lot of trauma when I was little. Um, My dad was a missionary when I was small, and I honor him very much. Um, He would go on long trips for his ministry, um, which left my mom, left with five young children to take care of my siblings by herself while also working full-time. This huge amount of stress and pressure revealed itself in very damaging ways for me at the time. So at a very young age, I went through lots of emotionally and mentally challenging times. I remember at this stage, I first learned this Bible verse for the first time, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, I'll read it out. Rejoice always, Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I struggled to understand what this meant. Was I just to keep smiling through the pain and pretend that nothing was wrong? Is that what being a Christian meant? Later in my life, I found this verse, Revelation 21, verse 4. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The Lord helped me understand. Our joy is not reliant on the present, but it is in the final day. It is in Jesus. There are lots of pleasures to be found in this world. With enough power and money, what is there not to like? all the latest trinkets, gorging ourselves on delicious food, exploring all different kinds of pleasures. There is a reason why so many people turn from Christianity to chase after these things. So what's the downside of living this way? When the time comes, you will die. I will die. And there's nowhere in this world we can hide and nothing you can buy that will stop it. All of this worldly joys are killed off by death. What about God? Can God give us such a thing as lasting hope and joy that is stronger even than death? Yes. Yes, he can. And he has proved it through the resurrection of Christ. And this is the eternal joy that persists even through the biggest loss in your life, and even through death. This is the heart of ultimate Christian hope and joy. When that day comes for you and I to take our final breaths on earth, we will know that our waiting has not been in vain. Because even though we may die, the promise of God cannot. So hear this encouragement again from our Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, 
And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And verse 18, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Thanks, Joe. Shall we pray? Our God, thank you for speaking clearly, lovingly, into a pretty confronting space to think of our own frailty and one day our own death and to be reminded of those that we have lost to the sadness of death. Lord, what a comfort. What a wonderful gospel that shines so brightly even into that space. What a wonderful saviour, Lord and master and friend has got us tightly. Lord, please let our thoughts about the certainty of Resurrection beyond death, put into perspective our lives and each day. What a privilege it would be to wake up tomorrow with one more day to live for you and only for you. And so we commit ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your welcome.